Um, I, I guess I just don't pay attention to how Luke does everything. I still hear. <laughs> so uh, there'll be a few things we probably won't do the same, um, but uh, we're going to have a good worship service, and we've got a great message. I'm tired of him leaving me with the hard ones, but it is what it is. So I've been called the step preacher today, so I guess that's what I am. Uh, but uh, glad Luke and Kelly are on vacation. I hope they're enjoying themselves. Um, I think that's important, and I'm glad that God's called us here for me to be able to do this. Um, and we'll get started. We'll try to uh, uh, have a good service and then get everybody back home so you can eat. Uh, you can try to not labor on Labor Day. I have to work on Labor Day. Uh, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you for that. It's also my third Thanksgiving and Christmas in a row to work. So, uh, But anyway, we're going to have a good morning. Um, I'll, I'm going to open this up in prayer and then let the boys take it with uh, worship. And um, I'll read the scripture before I get started. We'll do all that. And uh, then we'll, I'll do the announcements or whatever at the end. And uh, we'll go from there. So join me in prayer and we'll get started. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for this time to be here in your house. Lord, that we can freely worship you. We can, uh, we can come here without fear of persecution. Lord, we can come here and open up like we were talking about in Sunday school. Father, we can... Uh, we can be a church that makes people comfortable. We can be a church where folks can come in and talk about things that are going on in their lives and not feel uh, fear of uh, judgment or persecution or uh, estrangement. Lord, they can uh, confess things that are going on. They can talk about things that are going on. And we take the time and have the grace and compassion to listen and uh, help us each other through our problems. That's what a truly church family is. Lord, we pray for uh, our pastor and his wife as they travel. Uh, Pray that they're having a good, relaxing vacation. Keep them safe. Be with everyone that's traveling this weekend, Lord. It's a big, busy travel weekend, Lord. Uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of people on the roads. We pray for your protection. Pray for those that uh, are mentioned on the uh, prayer request cards of Sunday school today. And we just ask that this be a true worship of you and your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. in September. Y'all, we only have four months left in this year. It has flown by. So we need to do birthdays for September. We got some. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. September wedding anniversaries. None? No, All right. Well, we're going to start off our praise and worship. We're going to sing a hymn, so if you would stand. If you want to use your hymnal, it's on page 472. <clears throat> we're going to sing the first and last verses of Heavenly Sunlight. <laughs>
Thank you. 
Scripture this morning, y'all can be seated and uh, get us where we're going instead of. We're just going to do it a little different since the man's not here. <laughs> y'all can sit. Thank y'all. Glad y'all are here. Glad I'm here. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew. We're going to continue um, Luke series, uh, The Greater Fool. Uh, we'll be in Matthew chapter 7. Um, if he told me right. Gotta wonder sometimes. <laughs> Verses one through six, uh, man, I told him. I was like, the first one was you throw me under the bus talking about lust and all that. Now I gotta talk about judgment. <laughs> so I think he just looks ahead and goes, I don't talk about that. I'll go out of town. Ask me. Uh, I'm gonna lie to him one day. Just tell him I can't be here. I'm at work. So, but. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, and uh, hopefully I can uh, get out of my mouth what God's got for us this morning. Um, popular topic, super popular topic, probably in the last, I don't know, it's always been a popular topic, but I think probably more with the rise of social media and, you know, everybody's favorite phrase is now, don't judge me. Uh, and I don't talk about people with tattoos because it's obvious. I don't have a problem with tattoos, but I've seen several where, you know, people like to put on their body, only God can judge me, and believe it or not, they're correct. So, it's a, it's a sensitive subject, people don't like to talk about it, but we're going to get through it, uh, and hopefully uh, get out of it what Jesus is trying to say here. Um, but the first verse, verse, chapter 7, verse 1 says, Judge not, that ye be, ju that ye be not judged. By the way, for y'all that don't know, I'm in the King James, so try to keep up. <clears throat> for with verse 2 for with what judgment you judge you shall be judged and with what measure you meet it shall be measured to you again and why beholdest thou the mock that is in thy brother's eye but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye or how will I say to thy brother let me pull out the mock out of thine eye and behold a beam is in thine own eye thou hypocrite first cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mock of thy brother's eye Give not to that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again to rend you. What a great scripture. Jesus is continuing his sermon. Uh, and I want to get us in the right mindset. So I'm not here to judge you. Um, I'm not here, hopefully, to be a hypocrite. But we have to talk about these things and go through them because it's very important. Uh, just like the Sunday school book we're doing now is talking about today, how we act. Uh, in the house of God and how we act away from the house of God as Christians. I think a lot of people want to come on a Sunday and just say they were here, check a box, and go do whatever they want to do throughout the week, and they think God's just a small part of their life, the gospel's just a small part of their life, um, and that a lot of people that claim to be Christians do that, and their actions don't really um, follow what the Bible says. And when we try to bring those things up to them, What's the first thing they tell you? Don't judge me. Don't you judge me because you're a Christian. Jesus loves everybody. You can't judge me. There's some truth to that. We'll get into it uh, here in a little bit. But um, I want to get us in the proper mindset to tell you this story. Uh, I'm going to use uh, different names for different people. Um, this is not their real names, but two guys that were uh, back way back in their time were both very, very prominent religious leaders, um, both of them had completely opposite end of the spectrum as far as uh, doctrine. They did not agree with each other uh, as far as doctrine goes. <clears throat> and there was a story where we'll just call him Brother Mike was asked if he would see Brother Terry. I did that so I'd remember uh, <laughs> the names. And people in here can relate. I just related to half the congregation by using the word Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Terry. Brother Mike asked if he would see Brother Terry in heaven. And it was kind of a loaded question because the person asking the question knew that their beliefs in theology were completely opposite. They disagreed on a lot of things. Yet they were both uh, leaders of large churches. 
and uh, we nowadays use both of their philosophies and uh, um, their theology uh, in, in a lot of time. They were both great authors, great men of God, both of them. And Brother Mike said, they said, Brother Mike, will you see Brother Terry in heaven? And he said, nope, I don't think so. Which is exactly what everybody thought he was going to say. And he said, hang on, I'm not done with what I'm telling you. Brother Terry is going to be so close to the throne of God, and I'm going to be so far in the back, I'll never be able to see him. Think about that. Think about how this, uh, whoever asked the question is asking this loaded question and wants uh, Brother Mike to... To run Brother Terry in the ground. We don't agree, so I'm going to tell you what I really think about him. That's not what he said. He said, I won't be able to see him. We're both going to be in heaven, but he's going to be so far up in the front, I ain't going to be able to see him anyway. That's kind of like uh, we went to a Cubs game when we were in Chicago the other day, and my dad, uh, my dad's been to Wrigley Field several times. This is the first time I got to go. And, uh, I called him and said, hey, we're going to go to a Cubs game. And he's like, first thing out of his mouth, don't buy a nosebleed section. I ain't climbing the step. You know, he's all mad. But we know what it's like to be in the nosebleed, but we can't see what's going on. And that's what Brother Mike was saying about Brother Terry. So consider that and let's put ourselves in the mindset of these two men, especially the, the mindset of uh, Brother Mike, where they didn't agree at all on a lot of things. But... He didn't condemn Brother Terry. He didn't badmouth Brother Terry. He didn't gossip about Brother Terry. He said, that guy is going to be so much closer to God than I am. That's why I won't see him. He's going to be there, but I'm not going to see him. So uh, the definition of judgment, <clears throat> according to Merriam-Webster, is the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions. An opinion or a conclusion or a misfortune or a calamity Viewed as divine punishment. That's what it says. So, in this context, is it misfortune that we uh, when we start to judge others? Is it misfortune that uh, is what's happening? Is it is it just bad luck, or is it things and choices that we make, uh, conscious decisions that we make to do things to other people, or are we just uh, is it just misfortunate? Um, as Christians, I think we need to realize that biblical judgment, righteous judgment, is God's judgment only. Amen. It's not ours. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, Luke's. It's not uh, Brother Zach's down the road. It's not Brother Steve's up the road. It's not. It's not anybody's judgment. That's God's. That's God's job, and it's not our job. And I think people forget how Jesus taught us and what he's trying to teach them here he's trying to tell you you need to be real careful when you start actually judging others so what we've done in our society like we have with every other word if y'all notice like uh words don't mean what they used to yeah. and i don't want to stand here and act like you know back in the day it was so much better because i like air conditioning <laughs> and i like i like old things but there's some things i like about the war went. My dad said he'd have to lay on top of his covers at night till the attic fan would get going enough with the windows open, so he would sweat enough to start getting cold and get under the covers. I, I hate it. I don't want to be a part of that. I'm just gonna tell you right now. I have slept on the concrete floor in Mexico and woke up in a puddle of mud, but that's another story. <laughs> but we need to realize how we've dumbed down words. We've dumbed down words that are very important. We've dumbed down the word of love. In this same context, in a Christian context, we've dumbed down the word love. You know, you hear now, Jesus loves everybody, so I can, you know, we were talking in uh, Sunday school this morning about churches should not be a place where sin is acceptable. It should be a place where sinners come to repent of their sin, because we're all, we are all sinners, Amen. but we've blurred that line where it's like, well, Jesus loves everybody, and I'm going to do what I want, and he loves me anyway. He does love you, Amen. but you're skipping the part of the Bible, and in this chapter a little later where Jesus starts talking about people that have cast out demons and done all these things in his name, and he's going to tell them, sorry, I don't even know you. I don't even know who you are. Yeah. I'm sorry. You can't, you can't come with me. You won't be here with me. We need to think about that. We need to think about what true judgment is. And as Christians and as graceful Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ, how we correct each other, hold each other accountable, be, but be gracious to each other. It's Amen. not a judgment. It's a discussion that we have. If I have an issue and... 
I need to be comfortable enough in my church home or my church family to be able to come to somebody and have that conversation and not feel judged and not feel um, like I don't belong. We talk Mm -hmm. about uh, in Sunday school, and I know y'all all all heard the story, but just for an example of a pastor who was a new pastor at a church, Mm -hmm. and I think, and if y'all know the story better than I do, you can tell me, but um, I think that like the deacons knew, some of the people knew, but he came to church dressed as a homeless person. Walked into church, nobody knew him. Sat in the back, and then when the service started, they're all waiting on this pastor, and he gets up out of the back in his dirty, ragged clothes and walks to the front and said, I've been sitting here for 30 minutes and nobody's even spoken to me. Yeah. And we're going to change that here. That's the way we need to be. We need to be yeah. at the door yeah. greeting people uh, when they come in and make them feel welcome. And my... Not feel welcome in their sin, but make them feel welcome to be able to repent. That's what we need to think about. Uh, Man, don't judge me. How many times uh, have we heard that? We've just twisted the word up and confused it. Satan's done a really Satan really likes to uh, twist and confuse words and definitions. That's one of his greatest weapons. Where when he'll take a word and go, well, that's not really what it means. It can mean this. He did the same thing in the Garden of Eve. Well. Is that really what he meant? I mean, is that really what he meant, or did he mean this? What if he meant this? Uh, we'll get into the scriptures and start talking about it. Hopefully we can discover what we need to do and what, hopefully what we don't need to do when we start talking about judging others. Verse 1 says, Judge not that ye be not judged. What Jesus is telling them here is, if you judge someone, and by judge he means condemn them in a biblical manner, you will be held to the same standard by him because technically the father is the judge the only judge nobody here nobody on earth has been given the uh title or given the responsibility man what a responsibility given the responsibility or given the job to be the judge the eternal judge because jesus is busy and he can't do it god's too busy so we're going to pick somebody who is a good person and you're going to be the divine judge of people, uh, that's not what's happening. And he's telling you, <coughs> however we judge people, when we condemn others, we can expect that from him. Right. That's what we're going to be, uh, we're going to be held to that same standard. So before you start to judge your brother or sister or your family member or your friend, you need to think about, man, do I really want the Lord uh, judging me in this way? Do I want him bringing up what I got in my eye, which we'll see in a minute, uh, while I'm trying to help somebody get something out of their eye. And he talks about both of those things. Not only do we talk about the small splinter in somebody else's eye while we have uh, a log in our own eye and to get away from this beautiful divine language that the King James Word uses, and mot and beam and all those things. It's, it's a small splinter compared to a log but also when we're trying to help someone get something out of their eye and we're blind because of the things in our own eyes. It's not just the judgment or passing judgment or talking about someone. It's when you're actually trying to help someone, you need to be careful that you're clear to see how to help them in the correct way and be sure <clears throat> that you don't have anything. Uh, he is not saying, which a lot of churches are, uh, I didn't bring my Sunday school book up here, but uh, he talks about churches where um, people uh, are comfortable in their sin, not feeling the need to repent. And that's not what Christ is saying here. Christ is not saying, hey, live however you want. Let your brother live however he wants and everything's good. Because if you say anything to him at all, then I'm going to judge you the same way. So we've talked about before, Luke's talked about when you get saved, it's not that you're trying not to sin. It's that you don't want to sin anymore. It's, there's a difference there. It's mm-hmm. not, we've talked about it uh, a lot where the things that I used to want to do, now I don't even, I don't even entertain them. I'd rather be here. I'd rather be uh, reading my Bible. I'd rather, I, I turn the TV off a lot and read my Bible or I read our Sunday school book. If y'all know, we got a lot to read. Uh, and I love to read. And used to, you couldn't have caught me with a book. I was the Cliff Note King in high school. If we'd have had the internet or a phone in high school, I would have, man, that is one thing that I wish I had, too. Uh, the little store down in Gardendale, what's it called, Corey? The Book Basket? Is that what it's called? You remember? Yeah. 
Cliff know he had them all. If anybody <laughs> ever had Miss West class at Morgan Jordan, you better get the Cliff notes because she was going to read the book to you and start asking you questions. But, um, you know, that's, that was me. That was me. Uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, man, that would have been. Whew. But he's not telling us that uh, we shouldn't hold others accountable and then we shouldn't be um, trying to help each other live a righteous lifestyle. That's part of what being a church family is. But he's trying to help us understand how we are to go about communicating that with each other, how we're to go about uh, if you've got a brother or sister who you know is saved, who you know is in Christ, and something is just afflicting them, something is just bothering them, how we go about helping them through that, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to help people uh, in our family no matter what. Uh, I'm going to joke about my dad because it's just easy to joke about my dad, but um, <laughs> a couple stories. He, it's a... Uh, this is how we're, we're supposed to be family, and I try to be, and my son is here, and you, no need to stand up if I'm not telling the truth. Just sit, sit there. You still live in my home. <laughs> so I ran out of gas one day, and I'm on the phone with Amy, and I can see the gas station. And I thought I had, my truck has two tanks, and I thought one of them was full, and of course it was not. And I'm just, I'm in there flipping that switch, trying to get it, and I can see the gas station and look up, and there's my dad filling up a gas can. And I said, well, I'm just going to borrow dad's gas can. So I run over there. Well, he's getting gas for somebody at the screen print shop that barely made it to work to put into his car. I said, hey, let's put this five gallons in my truck, and then I'll fill up the gas can for uh, the guy that you were going to. So. We go back, we fill it up, we're going back to my truck, and I'm like trying to hand him money. He's like, no, 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 what are dads for? And I thought, hey, that's nice. Put the $20 back in my pocket. So I take my truck to the gas station to fill it up. Look up, here he comes walking across over there, and he sets the gas can down right in front of me and walks off like, I thought dads were supposed to be, so I filled it up. I mean, I, he just said, I thought what are dads for? Don't worry about paying me. And then he makes me fill the gas can up anyway. I mean, he made me do it anyway. I mean, my goodness. Uh, the next story, we go to, um, I mean, he helped me, but I had to help him. It was, I thought dads filled up gas cans for their son and didn't make them pay it back. The next one was, uh, I had a flight tower on the way to work Friday. And I'm in, I'm where the expressway meets 280, the flyover, if anybody has ever been there. And I had a good safe place to pull off. Get in the back of this blazer and the spare, I have a good spare, it's flat, there's no air in it. Well, once again, the only human I know that lives in that area is my father. It's like 7 in the morning, so I call him, 6.45, and I'm like, hey, are you busy today? And his answer was, well, I'm supposed to play golf at 8.15. And I said, well, I got a flat and the spare's flat. I need somebody to take me to the gas station to put air in the spare tire and then we can move on. And the whole time we're doing this, all he can talk about is, he keeps looking at his watch and doing all this stuff. He tried to leave before I got the tire out of the back of the truck. When I got, he pulls back up, we got air in the tire. He's trying to leave and he's in a hurry to get to uh, his golf game. and I talked to Amy, I called her finally and told her what happened and I was like, man, I hope I don't do that to them when I'm trying to help them. Uh, what, you know, I was like, what, why is it so hard for him just to call his golf buddy and go, hey man, I'm going to catch you on the third hole and be a little late. That did, of course, by the way, he wasn't late. I t then I texted him later that day and I said, dad, I appreciate what you did. I, you helped me out. I'm sorry if I made you late. And he's like, oh, it doesn't matter. What's more important is you being safe. And I'm like, well, it seemed like it mattered for the 15 minutes. <laughs> So think about how you help your family and your church family uh, and the attitude we have. But that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. Uh, and he's actually to say, um, he's talking about an eternal judgment, which is the correct definition for this word used in this context. It is not trying to help someone better their self or better their life. It's, uh, which is what we've done the word down to where if you say anything to anybody, you're judging. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not judging you. I'm trying to talk to you. And it doesn't matter if you're talking religion or work or whatever. Uh, you know, 
I'm sure now kids doing homework, get your homework done. Don't you judge me now. I do homework. Well, I'm not judging you. I ask you a question. But that's what we've done that word down to. Verse 2 talks about the same things where <clears throat> he's saying, for with that judgment that you judge, you will also be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall also be measured unto you. So the way that we talk to others and the way that we judge others will also be passed on to us by him, not by some other human, but by the actual divine judge, right. the actual judge. This is a warning. Amen. You better be careful how you correct your brothers because if you correct them in a way that is an eternal judgment, that's exactly how I'm going to correct you when it comes right. time to do it. Amen. So we need to think about those things. And how we measure others. I mean, how many times have we sat around, and it doesn't matter what church you go to or how big or small it is, the same people are doing the same thing all the time. It's the right. same one folding chairs. It's the same one uh, putting the chairs out. It's the same ones cleaning up. It's the same ones doing that. And we measure. We'll sit over there and watch them, and we'll go. Or we'll be the ones doing the work and go, Jonathan ain't even out there. Jonathan's just sitting over here doing nothing which is typical. <laughs> I'm measuring him, but that's how we'll be measured. When he's talking about how, I think the scripture says, uh, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured you again. How we judge, how we measure people, you know, well, they hadn't been here in three weeks, and we had a work day, and we got spaghetti to cook, and they ain't coming. That's what we're doing. That's a judgment. That's We're measuring people by how many times they come here, how many times they come through the door, and what they do while they're in this building. Well, I vacuumed the whole sanctuary, and when I got back there to the lobby, somebody grabbed the vacuum cleaner and said, I'll finish it up for you. Well, thanks a lot. Like the Jeff Foxworthy joke where he's talking about they've been on a four-hour trip to a family reunion or whatever, and his wife's like, you want me to drive? And he's like, yeah, why don't I pull it over here and you whip it in the driveway for us? I've been driving for four hours. That's kind of what we're doing. We're measuring people. We measure people by their attendance. We measure people by uh, whether or not they come on a Sunday night, whether or not they come on a Wednesday night. And Christ is telling us that's not how it should be. We need to think about that. You might want to think about, uh, do you really want Jesus and the Father measuring you up the way you've measured up all these people your whole life because he knows he hears it whether you say it out loud or not he knows yeah. he sees when you cut your eyes at somebody when they walk in and maybe they've never been here before and they're they look different or they smell different or uh we know what they were doing last night and we don't want to get anywhere near them or we went to high school with them and even though for me it's been 30 years and we think they're the same person they were in 1996 I'm not the same person I was, trust me. Trust me. I am nowhere near that person, and I thought that I was good. If you'd asked me, I was good. Now, my mama might have told you something a little different, but she was telling the truth. You could have asked a thousand people what they thought about me, and they were, oh, he's a great kid. Raised great. I was raised great. You ask my mama, huh, she's going to tell you the truth. Oh. Lying, sneaking, <laughs> caught him doing all the way. I, if you want to have your, you better keep your eyes on me. Uh, and I was pretty good at it. Um, we had a substitute teacher one time that spent the entire lunch period running me in the ground and my mother. She had no idea she was talking to my mother. Not one time did my mama stop and go, you talking about my son, he's a good kid. She just let her finish. <laughs> <laughs> Never disagreed with her. Now I got trouble, Miss Brooks, by the way. Everybody remembers Miss Brooks. Lord. I, substitute teachers. At more majority substitutes are supposed to be 106. If you weren't 106, don't apply. She told me to go to Mr. Charter's office, and I didn't go to Mr. Charter's office. I went to lunch. I was hungry. You know why? Because I didn't think Miss Brooks was going to go to Mr. Charter's office after class. And guess where she went? Down there. Guess who wasn't there? That'd be me. My mama was subbing. Miss Brooks goes to lunch, my mom was at lunch, and Miss Brooks spent 30 minutes telling my mother what a worthless human she thought I was, and not one time did my mother defend me. I got home and she said, did you get in trouble today? And I'm like, how? Oh, yes. <laughs> how did you know? I said, did you talk to Mr. Trotter? She said, no. I said, well, how did you know? She said, Miss Brooks 
sat at lunch with me and for 30 minutes told me how terrible she thinks you are, and I'd agree with her. <laughs> so, you know, you're not going to get any uh, sympathy, but I thought I was good. I thought, man, my coaches and my teachers, they thought I was great. But we need to be careful. We need to think about uh, how we look at others, how we measure others. Not just judgment, but how we measure them. How we, uh, let's just say somebody takes a job on a committee and then you're on that same committee and you start talking about, well, they don't do nothing except over and look on their phone the whole time we're in a meeting. I don't even know why they're on here. We need to be careful with that. Jesus looks on us with grace and compassion. Yeah. Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't. When you walk into the room, Jesus doesn't look and go, well, there he is. <laughs> He's been. He ain't been here in a month. And he ain't got a good excuse. I've been coming. I've been here for 2,000 years every Sunday, and he missed three in a row. That's not how he looks at us. Every time you walk in the door, every time you bow your head, close your eyes, or every time you drive down the road and start talking to him, it is nothing but grace and mercy. Amen. Nothing but grace and mercy. Amen. And that's why he died for you. Why would he come and die, come and spend all that time, the three years preaching, the three years telling us how it's supposed to be, this beautiful sermon that we hear, and sacrifice himself if he didn't love you? Why would he do that? Amen. It makes absolutely no sense. But we need to think about the grace that has been extended to us, how quickly we forget about God's grace to us when we start looking at somebody else and start picking them apart. It's really easy. You heard the, uh, you heard the expression, don't throw rocks if you live in a glass house? Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. We all live in glass houses. Yeah. You better be careful throwing rocks. Because uh, what happens is when you start throwing rocks, People don't like you. Y'all ever been hit with a rock? Yeah. My stepbrother's three years older than me. And when, it's a whole lot different when you're little, but uh, I was six and he was nine um, when we first met. And then uh, it's hard for a six-year-old to deal with a nine or ten-year-old. We had a playroom downstairs in the house. And his entertainment on a Friday night was to stand at one end of the room and throw my Maxbox cars at me as hard as he could. Uh, look, I know y'all are going, oh, poor, I got him back. <laughs> it might have taken me 10 years, but I'll tell you that story. So uh, he got he got what he had coming to him. But if y'all have been hit with a red hurts. So when somebody hits you with something, a rock, guess what, what are you going to do? You're going to pick up a rock and throw it back. So we need to be careful. Don't be fooled into thinking that people don't know or people aren't trying to find out what you got going on. Right. Because they do. It happens all the time. And don't tell a fireman. Mm -hmm. Y'all think it goes on at the beauty parlor? Something happens in the fire service, it travels faster than the people that's actually happening to you. Know. They, they, there's people that don't know you that know what happened to you before you realize what happened to you. I mean, I'm telling you, uh, we need to be careful about throwing rocks. We need to be careful when we start gossiping. You know, gossip is a rock. We need to be careful when we start throwing those rocks. We need to be careful when we start throwing those judgments at people because, according to this scripture, Jesus may pick up a rock and throw it back at you. Right. If you don't think your life can be shattered, if you think you're living the right life, start throwing rocks at people and see what happens. We have got to, uh, we have got to extend grace to each other. Amen. And we've got to understand the definitions of those words, grace and judgment. When I need to be corrected, it is not someone judging me. Um, my coaches... I told all my boys that play ball, and even now when <clears throat> they go into the workforce, you have got to be coachable. You have got to be able to take some criticism mm -hmm. and not take it personal and not feel like you're some sort of failure and learn from it. Uh, it's hard to do. The athletes, and the only reason I, you know, that's, it doesn't matter what it is, but athletes, it's hard for some of them, especially good ones. People that are athletic, that are good at something, it's hard for them to hear coaching because they think they got it all figured out. And sometimes <clears throat> we as athletes take it personal when it's not personal. Um, Jacob has struggled with that, and he's now in San Diego about to go through some of the hardest training in the world. And I tell him every day, you've got to be coachable and you've got to be humble. These guys, it's not personal. We've got, but we don't need to be a drill instructor when we're doing it correctly in the house of God. We don't need to be that drill instructor or that hard coach or teacher or principal or boss or whatever when we're trying to help each other 
in within our church family, within our own families. We've got to be careful about what we say, and we've got to remember to extend grace. Amen. Moving on, verses 3 and 4, I put them together. Um, it says, And beholdest thou thy mock, splinter, that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam or log that is in thine own eye? Or how will I say to another, Let me pull out the mock out of thine own eye, and behold, a beam is in your eye? How are you going to see clear to help your brother when there's something all in front of you that you haven't cleared up, that you haven't got fixed? Anybody ever had something in their eye? Mm -hmm. my, I don't, my eyes are magnetic. I didn't know dirt and dust was magnetic, but apparently this guy, it, I'm talking about glasses on, shield over my face. It's going to, I don't know. It goes around my head. It comes in from the back. I don't know what happens. But I was working on a Jeep one time. Underneath it, this was a long time ago. I'm much smarter now. No, no, nothing on. I'm just gonna do something real quick, and something falls in my eye. Of course, you know, typical idiot. I start rubbing my eye. Got my shirt. Can't see. So then I shut my eye and fix whatever I was fixing, and continued on. And I tried to. I couldn't eat. I couldn't. I, I went out that night with some friends. I couldn't eat. I think we tried to go bowling. I couldn't do. I just walked around with one. It would not come out, and nobody could see it. And it felt like. I mean, it was small, but it felt like this pulpit in my eye. I couldn't do anything. So finally, after hours of being an idiot, I go to the uh, Callahan. I found they got a emergency room. By the way, if you don't know that, you can go anytime, day or night. To the little building down there by UAB, and they will help you with your eyeballs. Terry Max grinning, he understands. I didn't know, and I didn't want to go to the ER. Nobody wants to go. To, well, most sane people don't want to go to the ER unless you really need them. But I go in there, and this doctor like puts these things on where I can't blink, and he's like digging in there with a Q-tip that's you know real long, and, he, and it was a pretty big piece of metal that had just got I don't know it fell off the thing and. I had scratched my lens all up. He put all this yellow stuff in there. And the, but the minute that he got it out of my eye, the relief, I mean, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. When it finally, <laughs> when that gnat finally, you cry it out of your eyeball if you've ever been outside in the summertime in this state, you got the gnat in your eye. But how, think about that. Even a gnat, as small as they are, do you think that you could do any kind of precision work with a map drive. There's no way. I wear glasses underneath all vehicles and sometimes when I'm not underneath them from now on. But that was awful. I mean, I could barely see to walk. I couldn't eat. How am I supposed to go <coughs> show somebody how to eat when I can't see to eat myself? It's impossible. Right. Jesus is trying to give us that example. We need to spend our time and our efforts removing the beam or the metal shard or the mat or whatever out of our own eyes. The sin and the content, you know, the contentment and all these things. We need to get those things out of our life before we start bringing up those things in somebody else's life. And we all do it. I don't, you know, well, at least I do. I know there's probably some people here who've never done that. But think about how you feel when that gnat finally gets out of your eye or that piece of dirt or whatever. Do you get uh, splinters? I had a metal piece of metal splinter in my hand for about five years. I could not. Every time I try to get it, I get a little piece of it, and it would break or whatever. I don't even know. And no joke, like two months ago, it finally came out of my hand. Oh, it's unbelievable, the relief that we have. So think about if we would clean up all the mess in our lives, how relieved we would feel and how refreshed we would feel and how we could go, hey, I had a splinter in my hand. Let me tell you how I got it out because it's gone now. How am I going to tell you how I got it out of my hand when it's still in my hand? Because you're going to look at it, if you're smart, and you can see it go, the splinter's still in your hand. Don't tell me how to get it out. You can't even get it out of your own hand. Think about that. When we start talking about when we care for someone, when we love someone, and we want them to walk in righteous lifestyle and live the way Christ has asked us to live, they're going to look at you and go, your life's a mess? What are you talking about in my life? Right. Or you don't do the things that you're asking me to do. Uh, the quickest way to get people... <laughs> On the opposite side of you is to be the do as I say, not as I do person. Uh, don't, ask, don't ask me how I'm doing. But I felt so relieved. When our sins are forgiven, when we're honest with ourselves about what's going on, the relief 
the joy that we have when we come into the house of God, where we know they're they're not gonna, I'm not gonna be judged, I'm not gonna be criticized, I'm gonna be loved, I'm gonna walk in, not walk in and feel good about the sin that I've been committing for the last however long, but I'm gonna feel good about asking for forgiveness and repenting of that sin. Amen. That's the difference. That's where we forget. We just don't tell anybody. Jesus is telling us in verse three and four that we should repent, turn from our own sins. Quit worrying about somebody else's sin. It's technically uh, between them. It's not something for you to worry about, especially if you're suffering from the same problem. Right. When you're suffering from the same problem. Think about how different the conversation is. And I'm just going to use this example because it was in my life. How different the conversation is from two people that have survived cancer or that have cancer how they communicate with each other and how loving and caring and forgiveness and all that is and the grace that's used and the compassion and how harsh we talk to each other, somebody else about their sin when you're a sinner too. Right. Think about the difference between the two. That's the difference in the conversation that needs to be had. The conversation's got to be had, but we've got to think about how we present that conversation. Verse 5, it says... Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mock out of your brother's eye. How in the world can I get a splinter out of Terry Garrett's hand if I got a splinter in my hand? I obviously don't know how to get a splinter out. That's what it, I promise you that's what he's going to tell me. Right. You got a splinter in your hand, don't touch me. That's what, and I would, I would say the same thing. Don't come to me and tell me. I don't talk to people about losing weight. <laughs> you want to know why? Because they're going to look at me and go, yeah, you seem to be really good at losing weight. I mean, I don't talk to people about diets because I like chicken wings and donuts and all that stuff that tastes good. But how can we instruct others on how to do something that we're not able to do? The first thing that comes to my mind is a Facebook post I saw uh, a while back. And it bothered me. And let me say, the intention of the post was good. I know the person that posted it, and they are a Christian. Uh, I have no doubt about that, and I really believe that their intentions were good. But the post bothered me, and I'll tell you why it bothered me. What they were saying was right in a certain way, but it's how it was presented. The post was about travel ball. Don't, that's a whole other. And if y'all play travel ball, I ain't, that's fine. Uh, I'm not condemning travel ball. I don't. I didn't do it. My boys didn't do it. Uh, I know a lot of people that are going to go to heaven and their kids playing travel ball all the time. So y'all want to say that. But the post was basically to try to crunch it down. Was if you're a parent. And your kids are playing travel ball, you're basically sending them to hell because y'all ain't church and it's your false God. You're, I mean, you're talking about judgment. You're telling people you're going to go to hell if you don't stop playing travel ball. That's divine judgment that this person has no right to cast on anyone. Right. You're ruining your child's life. You're not in church. Therefore, you can't be a Christian. All these things. And then I started to read, there were close to 400. Talking about throwing rocks, being in a glass house, 400 comments on this post, and not one of them. Not I read, I didn't read all of them all the way through, but I read the majority of them. Not one of them that I read said, hey, man, you're right. Thank you for enlightening me, and my I am leading my family straight to hell, and I appreciate you pointing that out to me, and we're going to repent, and we're going to be in church, not one all this guy did was make a bunch of people mad. And some of the comments were, I know you, and I know your family, and I see you when you're not in church, and I know exactly. Don't even start talking to me. Don't try to pull that splinter out of my hand because you got a big one in yours. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to be real careful. That's not how we bring others to Christ, and that's not how we talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in mm -hmm. sin. Y'all, we I think we forget sometimes people that are not saved and people that don't know Christ don't know that they're in sin sometimes. We have a hard time. Paul said it. 
when I was ignorant. Paul thought the right thing to do for God was to kill people that were worshiping God's son. That, he thought that was the best thing he could do. And from what I understand and from what I've read and through the history books, he was pretty good at it. Paul was an assassin. And I don't know if we take, that's another word, because of video games or whatever. He was an, a, a paid murderer. Yeah. And very, very good at it if you read things. doesn't go into a lot of detail in the Bible, but if you read the history books about Saul, that guy was very good at what he did. Yeah. Very good. But he said he did those things in ignorance. Mm -hmm. So when you start talking to people that don't have any idea who Christ is, who he really is, and any idea about God's word, about what they're doing wrong, they're not going to react in the way I think that we wish they would. we got to be yeah. careful how we present that. Uh, and like I said, don't, don't get mad at me. I don't, I don't have any issues with travel ball or anything like that. It was just an example. But it's God's job to decide people's divine judgment, not our job. We need to be careful. We start to condemn others, whether they're church family members or family members that don't go to church. Ten times out of ten, all you're going to get is a very defensive reaction. And we certainly don't need to do it out in public. It doesn't need to happen out in public. Um, it needs to happen. One of the good quotes in the Sunday school book, and I don't have it in front of me, so I'll try to paraphrase this. A pastor once said, those that are in the church family that are non-repentant, the elders should protect the family from them. Those that are in the church family that are repentant, the elders should protect them from the church family. So people need to come here and hear God's word and have the Spirit convict them in a way and have us live a certain way where they know that something's not right. <clears throat> if the Spirit lives in you and you're doing something that's not right, you're going to know. And they feel comfortable enough to repent and we protect them for that. We don't Amen. condemn them and we certainly don't tell them what their final judgment is. Amen. When we speak to others about sin, we need to be sure that that sin has either been something that we've gotten rid of in our lives or we're actively working through it. We should be able to discuss right. that and say, let me tell you what God's doing for me. Let me tell you what I struggled with and how I'm going through it now. I'm still struggling <clears throat> and try to help people that way. Amen. Verse 6, and we'll start to close. Uh, the way the King James writes this, it can be very symbolic and confusing. And I tried, I looked up several commentaries and what I gathered from what it says <laughs> It says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, <clears throat> neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, I know this may be a little bit, if you got a dog at home that you treat better than your own kids, that's your business, and its food is in the refrigerator and it comes in a little package from a farm somewhere, hey, that's great. But a dog is a dog, and it'll always be a dog. And now it's biblical that they're dogs, and dogs don't care where it comes from. I promise you. Yeah. If you've ever watched your little precious dog, when it don't know that you're watching it, it don't. It does not discriminate between holy and unholy. Trust me, it doesn't care. It doesn't care if it's food, it's gonna eat it. Whether it knows it's going to get sick or not, it's going to eat it anyway. We need to be careful. But what he's talking about is, Jesus is talking to Christians here. This is a Christian verse. This is not a verse for lost people that won't understand it. Uh, I've never had anybody got a pig farm, raised on a pig farm, been around a pig farm. They stink. They taste good, but they stink. Uh, and pigs are pigs. And you can clean one up. And turn it loose, and where's it going? Right back to the mud hole, because that's what makes it happen. What do you do? Now, I know some of y'all, I'm really joking. I don't want y'all to get mad at me. But, like, you little dog, what do you got to keep it from doing when you take it out, when you get through bathing? Don't let it outside. What's it going to do? Roll around in the dirt. If my lab gets wet, the first thing he does is wall around in the dirt. And he stinks all the time. He's not allowed in the house. But that's what they do. 
Not one pig or dog has ever been bathed and went to its owner and went, man, I feel good. Thank you so much. I've been dirty my whole life. I'm going to go over here and sit on the chair, and I'm not going to lick myself in improper ways or do this, and I'm not going to go get in the mud. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna be, I'm not a dog anymore, or I'm not a pig anymore. I'm not going to go right back to it. And what Christ is telling Christians is we're to hold on to the things that are holy. Those who are believers and followers of Jesus Christ are to keep the things that are holy, holy. Amen. Because a dog doesn't know the difference. Amen. Christians know the difference between what's holy and what's not holy. We can talk about what those things are, but it's things such as the Lord's Supper. Things such as gathering together and having a worship service. We don't throw those things to the ones that don't understand it because they won't understand it. Right. we got to be careful how we present it. Hogs are the same way. Uh, I mean, I, I just think it's a great example. Y'all ever seen a pig wearing a pearl necklace? <laughs> or a bracelet or earrings. Miss Piggy. Huh? Miss Piggy. Yeah, Miss Piggy. Well, <laughs> I, they, they don't care. If you threw a real pearl, and they, I, I don't wear jewelry, I'm pretty sure it's probably expensive. Threw it out there to the hogs. You think one of them's going to snort over there and grab that thing and go, look what I found. Let me clean this up, put it on. Nope. They're going to walk on top of it because it doesn't taste good, and they're not, that's the way they're going to do it. Right. We're not to throw these things out. We're not to give those who don't understand the things that Christ has held sacred for those of us that are in his family. Now, that is not an excuse to be arrogant or an excuse to be uh, better than someone or judgmental of someone, but what he's telling them is be careful what you give to those that don't understand what you're giving them. Help them understand what you're giving them before you give it to them. I never, I grew up in a Lutheran church. Thank y'all for your forgiveness. Amen. I, did, I grew up in a Lutheran church, and we took the Lord's Supper every, every Sunday. Every Sunday. And it wasn't until I left and got saved that I understood how special that was to me. Right. And thankful that our leader here, our pastor, finds it special because Baptist churches that do the Lord's Supper would probably be kicked out of the Southern Baptist Association if they found out how often we do it here. But it's starting to come back around. I've been in a Baptist church where it might happen once a year and it might not happen but once every five years. For whatever reason, whatever theology that is, I don't know. I just know this is what Christ is talking about. If Jesus Christ said I'm supposed to drink his blood and eat his body, then I think it's probably important that we do that. Yeah. Those are the things that people that are lost. I didn't understand when I was a kid sitting at Good Shepherd Lutheran in Gardendale taking that wonderful, wonderful <coughs> gift that Christ gave us at the Last Supper in the upper room. And now I hate when I'm like at work and we're doing it. I hate, I hate missing it because now I understand. I would never understand. I trampled on it like a pig and I just did it because somebody threw it in front of me like a dog. My dog chases stuff all the time. I wouldn't run like that. Dogs are stupid. Why are you running? What, what are you, if I throw a ball, he'll take off. He don't care what he runs into. Runs in and two, out of and two. They don't care. That's the same way I was. Put it in front of me, and I just did it. I went through the class. Luther Church, Catholic Church, Methodist Church, I think. Got to go through a class to mm -hmm. take communion, call communion. I, I went through the class. meant nothing to me. It was just, well... If I want to go up there and drink out a little cup and eat a little piece of bread, i got to go through this class for two, two years, by the way, as a junior high school. I'm going to close. We need to look at ourselves before we look at others. Think about that. Amen. Be sure to look at yourself before you start looking at your brother or sister in judgment and measuring. Don't be trying to measure or worry about measuring. That divine judgment <clears throat> is God's. And here's the truth. We all deserve it. Right. Before Christ died for me, I deserve, I deserve it now. He shouldn't have died for me. He shouldn't have done that for me. I don't deserve what he gave me. We've right. all des we are all deserving of the judgment of God. Believe Amen. me. If Jesus was graceful and willing to sacrifice himself for us, we should follow that example. And I've got a quote out of a book that I read um, from Charles Spurgeon. Whether you like him or not, I think he's got some really great quotes. But... Uh, it reverts back to the story of Brother Mike, Brother Terry, that I told you at the beginning. Somebody asked him what he thought about that. What do you think about Brother Mike's comments? And he said, 
As I read each remark or the remarks made by Brother Mike, I have said to myself, by this, I know as a Christian that he must be a Christian. For I saw that he loved his brother, Brother Terry, even while he so earnestly di differed from him on certain points of doctrine. Yes, dear brothers, if we cannot differ and yet love one another, and if we cannot allow each other to go his own way in the service of God and to have liberty of working after his own fashion, if we cannot do that, we shall fail to convince our fellow Christians that we ourselves are Christians. Amen. Let people do what they do. If they're serving God, don't criticize how they do it or how often. Don't measure what they're doing and how they're doing it to what you do. If you feel led, I'm pretty sure that I can say this with confidence. <clears throat> if you're going to work and complain like Martha about Mary, we know how that went. Maybe you don't need to be doing the work to start with. If you're going to come and serve at Liberty or whatever church, it doesn't matter. If you're going to serve God in any capacity and then judge and measure how you serve compared to how somebody else is serving, maybe you ain't serving for the right reason. That's right. We need to think about those. But Charles Spurgeon said, we can't convince other Christians that we're Christian if we're going to judge how somebody goes about their service to Christ and their service to God. We need to be careful that we're not judging those. I thank y'all so much for allowing me to do this, and I hope that we uh, we learned something today that we can take with us uh, away from here. I'm so thankful for the opportunity that Luke uh, gave me, and uh, I joke with him about the subjects that he leaves for me. But um, man, they've they've helped me grow and learn um, in so many different ways, and look at uh, the scriptures different than I've looked at them before. But we really need to be careful. Uh, how we talk to our brothers and sisters and especially how we talk to those that are not in the family, that are not Amen. children of God, that, uh, that don't know, that they don't know, they don't know the difference. Um, when Charlie was two years old and put his hand on the stove, he didn't know any better. If he does it now, I'm going to call him an idiot. There's a difference between that. He's, he's almost 25. I'm pretty sure he knows not to put his hand there. When he was two, he didn't know any better. And uh, we need to make sure that we're showing others and each other the grace and the forgiveness that Jesus shows you every single day. And he shows me every single day, all day long. There's not this running tally of how bad you are. He's not. He, he doesn't do that. That's not what he does. It's not a free uh, pass to sin or do anything like that. It is strictly how we're supposed to live through his example. Uh, let me pray and then let Corey come up and close us and then I'll... Uh, Read announcements and we'll get out of here for hot dogs and hamburgers or dirt track, wherever you're going. Uh, enjoy your weekend and your day off uh, if you have one. <laughs> I don't have one, but uh, I'm going to enjoy myself this evening. Father, we love you. Lord, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for your word, your guidance, and your son that teaches us how we ought to be. Lord, I pray that we take this literal, we take it out in the world, and we learn how to treat others as you treat us. How quickly. We forget how wonderful you are to us, and we think we're special, and we need to be reminded that we're not, and we need to be reminded that we deserve your judgment, Lord, and we deserve your wrath, and you sent your son to save us from that. Lord, protect those that are traveling, protect those that aren't here, be with those that are sick and can't be here, that want to be here, that desire to be here, and they have a sickness that won't allow it, uh, be with Brother Luke and Kelly as they travel and uh, enjoy time with family and each other. Give them a rest, Lord. We know that rest is important. You would have put it in Genesis if it wasn't, that they can come back refreshed and we can uh, get into the last half of, or the last third of this year and uh, really ramp up our worship for you and our favor for you. And then we would make anybody that walks through that door feel welcome and feel as though they can feel human and repent of the sins that they have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, please stand. He's in the nail scar hand.
No Bible study tonight. Happy Labor Day. Uh, Tuesday morning prayer, 9 a.m. in Glass Hall. Uh, business meeting, Wednesday night, 6.30. Thank y'all. I hope y'all have a great weekend. Um, it's just uh, it's just an awesome honor to be able to do that, and I thank God for it. Thank God for this church family. And, uh, man, we talked about Sunday school. A guy told a pastor he felt like a human when he came to his church, and uh, that's not a bad thing. He repented and gave his life to Christ because mm -hmm. of the way that made him feel. If we just keep doing what we're doing here and striving to uh, do what God would have us to do, uh, we're going to make people feel that way too. Amen. So, uh, y'all have a great afternoon and a great uh, holiday if you get one. Uh, I'm going to go listen to a bunch of loud cars and watch them go around in circles for a little while and get dirty, but uh, that's what I like to do on my off time. So, we'll sing the doxology and get out of here.